Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our kids. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I want to remind you, as always, at the beginning that we have a volunteer, Charlie Fabian, who is ready and willing to take your suggestions about materials to cover, items to flag, and so on, uh, to make you a kind of partner of this program. And if you have anything like that, please send it to him at charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Once again, charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Today's program is going to talk about a mammoth struggle going on between the labor unions and the Swedish government on one hand and Elon Musk and the Tesla Motor Company on the other. We're going to also look at the largest strike ever to hit Portland, Oregon, uh, a teacher strike and one that has enormous implications. We're going to talk about food issues here in the United States, this thing now called food insecurity, which the simpler ones amongst us used to call hunger. Then we're going to go with Charles, the new king of England, uh, to see how he makes money. And we're going to talk about a Michigan entrepreneur who's busy buying elections in the great American tradition. And our interview, this second half of today's program, will be a specialist on the military budget, Norman Solomon. So stay with us. I think we have an exceptionally interesting program for you. Let me start with the struggle between Elon Musk and Tesla on one hand, and the people and government of Sweden on the other. Let me begin by explaining that Sweden is a highly unionized economy. 90%, percent of workers in Sweden are covered by a collective bargaining arrangement between unions and employers, usually on an industry-wide basis. Here in the United States, by comparison, between 10 and 11 percent of workers are covered by union, not 90 percent. So Mr. Elon Musk had to learn, which he clearly hasn't done yet, what it means to be active in a place where unions are strong. So the unions informed him that if he wants to do business in Sweden, he's going to have to do business with the unions that are very powerful there. Mr. Elon Musk has no interest in doing that and therefore demanded to give worse conditions, worse wages, and so on than were acceptable to the union, and they conducted a strike. Wow. It involved a strike. Mr. Elon Musk has been anti-union, and famously so, all over the world. The strike began at the end of October and involved the union there, IF Metal, by name. Here's what's interesting. Neither side has given in. Mr. Musk, who can't understand what unions mean when they're powerful, refers to them as, I quote you now, insane, just the kind of terminology that's going to make for good labor management relations, don't you know? And here's what's begun to happen. Other workers are noticing, first in Sweden, Mr. Musk is now confronted with the fact that government workers have decided they're not going to produce the license plates delivered to Tesla, without which Tesla can't sell any cars in Sweden, and that's going to hurt his business. Moreover, now unions in Norway that produce components for the Tesla input of those components in Sweden, they're going on strike or at least refusing to produce those components anymore. And Mr. Musk is enraged and talking about and rumoring about there will be alternative places that the company can go. And why? Well, the production of most Teslas that are sold in Europe happens in Berlin, Germany. So maybe he'll find 
providers of inputs elsewhere. But here's the problem, Mr. Musk. Elsewhere in Europe is also highly unionized. Germany especially so. You move elsewhere, the union movement will move elsewhere too. You're not in the dominant position you are, say, in the United States anymore, Mr. Musk. The world is changing, and Mr. Musk and the folks like him are having to learn that they better change with it, or else their business is going to suffer big time. Quick other update. There has now been, literally as I go to press, a settlement, or at least a temporary settlement, of the strike, the largest in its history, at Portland, Oregon's public school system, serving 45,000 students, involving 4,500 teachers. They just got a settlement that offers them 14% increase of wages and a lot of improvements in how they can present to, teach to, prepare for being good teachers to the children of Portland, Oregon. Now, that's a win, a powerful one, a significant one. But I want to caution you, 14% in three years will about keep those teachers up to where the inflation is expected to be. Those teachers have suffered in recent years. That's why they struck. And they need more than keeping up with the inflation. They need real improvement. The high school, the teachers, they all need it. The union movement is a response to real needs. And it's winning important unionization and strike struggles. But those are a small part of what is necessary to offset the changes and the decline of capitalism in this country, which is becoming a bigger and bigger burden on workers. Good job, teachers in Portland, but more struggles lie ahead for all of us. I want to turn next to food in the United States, the food issue, the hunger in this country that now exists. And I want to do it for a particular reason. It's a way to correct the systematic miseducation that President Biden and his officials and many Republicans too are talking about. The so-called great economy. And then these questions, why don't people understand what the reality is? The problem is not the people. They understand it real well, as I'm about to show you. It's you, the politician, who is out of touch. And food shows it, because food is every day's necessity. Let's see how people in America are doing, and then we'll see whether the economy that they're doing it in should be called great, as opposed to desperately in trouble. Here we go. U.S. families reporting food insecurity. That's not enough food to eat. In 2020, it was 13.5%. In 2021, it was 13.8%. And in 2022, it was 17%. That's more than one in six families in the United States report not having enough food. But now listen to these numbers. 76% of households are shopping for more discounted food. They're buying food that is off price, and you can imagine what the reasons for that are. 58% of households are shopping systematically at less expensive food retailers. You know, the big box stores where you can buy, if you buy enough, at a lower price. 42% are shopping for less food per week than they used to buy, and 17% of households, again, more than one in six, are eating more food that is past its prime, that date printed on the food. Wow. This is in a country that still wants to think of itself as among the richest in the world. People who act out on their food behavior in this way are not living in a great economy. King Charles of England rakes in $75 million a year off of a leftover of feudalism. 
turns out in the old Duchy of Lancaster in northwest England, the unclaimed assets of dead people who live there are funneled to the king, who uses the money to maintain his properties, which the kingdom rents out to the public and makes a lot of money off of. Wow. The assets of dead people go to the richest people in England. What kind of notion of justice would you imagine that represents? And then my last update is one that is simple to state, but tells you so much about the United States. An entrepreneur, that's how he was, or she was, identified in the press as far as I could see. A Michigan entrepreneur offered a Democratic senatorial candidate in that state by name of Hill Harper, $20 million if he would drop out of the state Senate race and run against Rashid Tlaib, a famous Palestinian of origin, American citizen serving in the U.S. Congress. Now, what's interesting about that is not the urgency of this millionaire or billionaire to get rid of a candidate that is unwanted by him. It's the understanding that here in America, that's how this is done. You get the candidate that the people with the money want you to get. They're, they understand the system. It's about who would have $20 million to hire an army of people to go door to door, to give them the script, to teach them how to say the script, to make up whatever they can imagine might work, to fool, to mislead, to misstate, to nudge, to frighten the voters to go in one way or another. It's all about the money. So when you hear we have the best government money can buy, that's exactly what we have. We have a money-grubbing political class. And you know, they've all learned the lesson. The lesson is, if you offend the people with money, they'll spend their money getting rid of you. So even if you disagree with them, you better behave. You better worry lest they give their money to buy the alternative running against you in the next election. Wow. Wow. What a statement. And all of this is, get ready, legal. It's all legal. We've arranged the laws because the people who buy politicians get those politicians to write the laws that make it legal to buy the politician. Wow. When you have a system like that, with a tiny number of people possessing 20 million to give to a politician, and they do so, and they write the laws to make it all legal, you know what you have? You have a completely broken oligarchic system. That's not the kind you change anymore in the polite ways of politics. That's a system so far gone, it needs powerful, dare I say it, revolutionary change. We've come to the end of the first half of today's show. Please stay with us. We'll be right back with Norman Solomon on the military budget. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. I am very happy to bring to our microphones and cameras Norman Solomon, a man whose work I have followed for some years and who is really quite well known and therefore a special asset for us today. 
He's the national director of RootsAction.org, and he's the executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy. He's the author of a dozen books, including War Made Easy and his latest book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. So first of all, Norman, let me welcome you to the program. Hey, thanks a lot, Rick. Okay, let's jump right in. You call this the U.S. military machine, and you're very interested in its financial costs. Can you give us an idea of, of the size of that, since that's not so easy to understand? Yeah, it's mind-blowing because the corporate system is making a killing, literally and figuratively, on a massive scale that it's really hard to comprehend. Uh, during the so-called war on terror, we're talking 22 years now, uh, the so-called defense industry has spent eight trillion with a T dollars on that warfare. And then when you add up the total Pentagon spending during the last couple of decades, uh, it's a whopping $14 trillion. If you cost that out, just in terms of this so-called war on terror, uh, that averages out to about $400 billion every year. And I think quite often of what Martin Luther King Jr. talked about. He said this military spending is a demonic destruction suction tube that is drawing the resources for health care, education, housing, elderly care, children care, you name it. And this is what we're dealing with. Meanwhile, we have a few corporations. For instance, we've got Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, and their CEOs and their major investors and stockholders are just making huge profits. So a lot of people die. A lot of people are wounded psychologically and physically, but it's very, very profitable. You know, it reminds me of what a teacher of mine said years ago, that wars have three participants, the winners, the losers, and the profiteers, and then went on to explain to us that the profiteers don't care whether the wars are won or lost, so long as they can continue, say after the war, to continue to profit by having the next war be prepared for and built up for. It's just, it's a never ending kind of thing. What about the non-financial cost? You know, the things we can't measure in dollars and cents. That's a cost of war as well. Uh, these are huge losses that are part of why uh, the book subtitle that I wrote deals with the hidden costs of war. These are the human costs, environmental, people's lives, people's emotions, uh, people's well-being, the way in which our own society is traumatized in ways that are so normal, we don't give them a second thought. I mean, you can look at it in terms of numbers, uh, the lives. Uh, during this so-called war on terror, uh, 15,000 Americans killed directly in combat, and a little more than half of them are totally hidden because they are contractors. So the Pentagon doesn't even acknowledge that there are losses in terms of people's lives. You have uh, traumatic brain injury, a stunning number, hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of thousands of U.S. veterans suffering from traumatic brain injury, where their brains in many cases are never the same, this sort of trauma. It's interesting that we're hearing about, as we should, the harm for young people and others from playing tackle football professionally and in school. We're not hearing nearly so much about the much more widespread and serious injuries to people's well-being, literally to their own brains, their health, the depression, the domestic violence, which is so much higher among veterans, especially combat veterans and those with traumatic brain injury. We can go on and on. And a lot of the U.S. media hides the true human costs of war by only focusing, albeit very badly and very partially, on Americans. We had the Costs of War project at Brown University do an in-depth study, and the numbers are really staggering. Directly killed by the U.S. branded War on Terror, close to 1 million people, about 950,000, directly killed. Then when you go to the indirect deaths, 
infrastructure, health care, housing, all the different ways that people in Iraq and Afghanistan have suffered, have been injured, have died, 400 and a half million people. Can you imagine 4.5 million people killed by the U.S. war machine in the last 22 years? And we get virtually no coverage of them. They're reduced to the status of non-persons. So there's a nationalism, there's a jingoism, there's a strong current of racism that hides the true cost of U.S. wars. Now, some people might think if they're tuned into mass media, well, that's in the past, we had the war on terror, that's behind us. Absolutely wrong. The Brown University study found that the U.S. is currently engaged in some form in the counterinsurgency military operations in 85 countries. We had President Biden going to the UN two years ago and saying, we've pulled out of Afghanistan, the United States is no longer at war. Uh, Rick, not to put too fine a point on it, that was a complete lie. And we have the Pentagon budget now around $1 billion, especially when you include, I'm sorry, $100 billion without the inclusion of special supplemental aid. We have $100 uh, going to this person, to that person, $100 billion going to this, that person. I should uh, correct myself. This is, a, this is billions of dollars a day. We're talking Pentagon budget of about $1 trillion with a T dollars a day when you include the supplemental appropriations not just the annual, which is about $850 billion, but also we should think about the $44 billion that has been given in military aid to Ukraine in the last year and a half. We should think about the $3.8 billion that's hot wired in automatically going in military aid to Israel. And just in the last weeks, another $14 billion. This is taxpayer subsidies sending to other governments and entities to do the killing while the huge CEO, investors, stockholders, all the rest of it, they're just making a huge profit. So this is why and how we live in a warfare state. You know, it reminds me, listening to you, of a, of a remark made by a foreign leader when asked, why is it that people in your country and in so many countries around the world, quote unquote, hate the United States. And the answer that that leader gave was, no one hates the United States. But if what you must understand is if you're going to be the global policeman that drops bombs and, and sends drones to this country and that country, killing and injuring and maiming millions of people, there's going to be hostility. There's going to be bitterness, anger, resentment. People tell each other about their relatives, their neighbors, their friends, about what happened when the American plane flew overhead or the American military were stationed. It's not hatred of the United States. It's bitterness that you yourself have brought on you by your behavior. And the American who asked the question had no response, just sat there not having ever apparently heard such an idea before. The rhetoric really doesn't go very far outside the United States because let's face it, we are not convinced when somebody says, do as we say, not as we do. That's the message from Uncle Sam coming out of Washington. We make the rules, we break the rules. We tell people now that it's ho so terrible, which it is, what Russia has done, slaughtering people after an illegal, immoral invasion of Ukraine. But we've got the same people in Washington who are condemning Russia, who were gung-ho for the Iraq invasion in 2003, where an estimated up to one million people were killed based on lies. And so this, it's not even adequate to call it a double standard. This is a deadly rank hypocrisy that is central to US foreign policy. It's really about might makes right. And here in the United States, those who want a different kind of country, a different kind of government, it's imperative to us that we challenge it, we expose it, we organize, because if we leave it to the war makers, then a death culture will triumph. 
there used to be, and I believe it still exists, a famous table. And it may came, um, perhaps came out of Brown University's very well-known project of studying wars. Anyway, it listed the United States' known expenditure on military, and then the, the expenditures of the nine less countries, that is, ranking from the top United States the, to the, through the first 10. And the point made by the table was that the United States spends more on military than the next nine countries combined spend on the military. And the next nine included both Russia and China, and then the rest of them were allies of the United States. Is it does it continue to be as imbalanced as that with the United States spending wildly more money? And if so, why do you think the American people accept such a situation? That's very much the case. Uh, nine or 10 of the next countries uh, spending as much as the United States, all those countries combined, many of them, as you mentioned, are allies. And not only that, but the United States is the biggest weapons exporter in the planet, almost half, 40% of all the world's military exports for weaponry come from the USA, way dwarfing the second and third countries, China and Russia. Their exports on weaponry going down, the United States going up. You know, there's big, buzz, big, big business in the killing process and the industry. Why? Well, for an example, uh, the arms makers and manufacturers in the United States have 700 lobbyists on Capitol Hill to ply their wares, the tools of the killing trade. That's more than one member. That's more than one lobbyist for every member of the House and the Senate. There are huge campaign contributions that are given out on a routine basis, giving greasing the palms of members of Congress. I mentioned, and this is another example of the invisibility, I mentioned in my book, War Made Invisible, as an example, Adam Smith, not the economist, a Scottish economist, but Adam Smith, a member of Congress, a Democrat from the state of Washington, until just recently chair of the House Armed Services Committee in the last cycle of his reelection campaign, he received $400,000 from military contractors. And I do want to say, we shouldn't call them defense contractors. This has nothing to do with defense. The United States has 750 military bases overseas. It's not about defense. This is military. This is militarism. This is what Martin Luther King Jr. called the madness of militarism. So in that example, you've got Congressman Smith. Uh, he went to Washington and he gets just in one campaign cycle, 400,000. Well, of course, he green lighted all of this payola, all this money to the big military contractors like Raytheon, like Lock Lockheed Martin, like Boeing. And that's the way the system works. I really think it's important for us to see and understand that these military wars are class war. It's class war on people, the United States. We're being ripped off in communities around the country. The public sector is being decimated for health care. Public libraries not even open very much. The universities, the schools being damaged and decimated in terms of lack of funding. This is class war on working people, on wannabe working people, on children, on the elderly, while the fat cats, the very, very rich, get very, very richer because of this militarism. Norman, I wish we had more time, but you've made the case very, very eloquently. I want to remind folks the latest title of the book, War Made Invisible. Go out and get it, and it'll be an expansion on the points Norman made today. And for all of you, as I say at the end of every program, I look forward to speaking with you again next week.